Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Norma Jean Discovering Truths, the companion podcast to Marilyn Behind the Icon. My name is Gary Vitaco Robles. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and national certified counselor. I'm also the author of the biography upon which our podcast is adapted, Icon, The Lifetimes and Films of Marilyn Monroe. I'm also the co-producer and co-writer of the podcast, and today I'm joined by my illustrious collaborators who will be part of the conversation. Hey, Gary. We're all here today having another chat about episode three. Hey, Nina. Hey there, Randall and Gary. Good to be here. A very interesting episode. Yes, Chapter 3 focuses on Marilyn beginning to explore her family history. We titled it, I Was a Black Mark on a White Cross. So Marilyn is recalling a Sunday pageant at the Hollywood Bowl. She missed her cue, and she identifies as being the only black mark. And this symbolizes her feelings of being different from the other children and Mm -hmm. different in a negative way, being unlovable, unwanted, unworthy. One of the things I was thinking about when I was listening to this episode and listening to her talk about how she felt is how many of us as children, particularly if we come from a fragmentation like she did, just imagine you you are the only one that is exposed like that on stage and the shame she must have felt. And then I was thinking about, wow, if you don't have a soft place to fall on, you know, in terms of a a shoulder or to go home to a solid foundation, that shame has to continue to stay with you. And that's what really resonated for me when I was hearing her words in this episode. And for little Norma Jean, it became a defining moment for her. It wasn't like a bump in the road that she was able to recover from. It became, it turned into a narrative for how she identified herself. Yeah, that's why we have the opening scene. We wanted to pick a time as an adult when you heard the memory of that come back into her professional life on the set of Some Like It Hot. Of course, we really don't know if that happened or not, but the idea of Billy Wilder and Marilyn doing multiple takes of things, that's well known. And actually, Jack Lemmon's reaction when uh, he talks about the upper birth scene, which is an earlier scene in the film, that's actually taken from a TV interview that Jack did where he pretty much says those almost exact words in describing his feeling after Marilyn did it in one take. We are looking to be as authentic as possible in terms of what people actually said or what they actually felt. So that's one of the things in the opening scene that we use to illustrate how these things from childhood were affecting Marilyn as an adult. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, uh, you know, Gary, what was Marilyn and Jack's relationship like, at least in this scene? Um, it really felt like they had a very warm and engaging relationship. Exactly so. Marilyn felt very safe working with him, whereas she had some struggles with Tony Curtis on the film. Um, Jack was was very patient with Marilyn. He celebrated her talent. He understood her method acting technique. And he was able, although he had a different technique, he was able to mesh very well with Marilyn and continue to talk well about her even after her death. And we know that wasn't the case with uh, Tony Curtis. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, there was some, some definite interesting uh, statements that Tony Curtis would uh, say about Marilyn. But he, he took a lot of that back, right? After uh, Many while. years later, many yeah, years later. when it okay. no longer served him, he did. What did he say? So they, I, I bet the audience is going, oh, what did Tony Curtis used to say? So let's give them a little oh, insight. Oh, he said a lot that. of things. At the time when Marilyn was alive, he said kissing her was like kissing Hitler. Ooh. Um, at one point, Yikes. he referred to her as like a six or eight pound gorilla. But then toward the end of his life, when he mellowed, and I think he was no longer threatened with her as a competitor on the screen, he softened. He softened. Aww. And Marilyn had a very funny comment when she heard this. She was very hurt by it, of course. But she said, well, you know, maybe he was jealous because on the film, I wore prettier dresses than he did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's her. Funny. That's her sense of humor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, dresses you by know. Ori Kelly at that. We, we mentioned that in the in the beginning of the episode because who won the Academy Award that year? That's for right, black and white film costumes. So that's one of the things why that's important. That's in the show. So little little factoids like that we have fun throwing in for the fans. So the other thing that I find this one is a little different. As you experience these episodes, you're going to start to understand that each one has its unique flavor, and this one really sets up 
very strongly the relationship or the beginnings of the relationship with Greenson and Marilyn Monroe. And Dr. Greenson, for those of you that don't know who he is, and we're just introducing him, he was uh, the psychiatrist, uh, one of the psychiatrists for Marilyn. And why don't you set that up for us and really speak to the relationship that Greenson and Marilyn had? So much of Marilyn's later life was spent in therapy. And I just thought, since a lot of our show is about her mental health and the issues surrounding that, I wanted to transition into Greenson in a way that introduced him. So we picked this period in her life, the first time that they met and the first time that they really sat together, and the conversation that ensued with that. And the reason for that conversation, because of her working on the film with Yves Montand, she was in, and Gary, you can talk to this more, you know, a mental state where after the film, she was in some kind of confusion in her mind, mixing a lot of different things together. So the purpose of this episode is to kind of allow the audience to understand how uh, through a therapy session that a breakthrough can be achieved and where that might come from and how that might happen. Because there are things as Marilyn went through therapy that she evolved. She changed. It did help her. But at the same time, there were things that therapy couldn't solve or work through. So Gary, why don't you speak to that? So on the the set of Let's Make Love, Marilyn went into crisis and she was on the West Coast and her psychiatrist, Dr. Chris, was in New York. So she was referred to Greenson. And so she had these initial sessions with Greenson. And documentation of these sessions uh, still exist in Greenson's record. So we know how these sessions started. You know, that is all accurate. Um, Greenson wrote back to um, Dr. Marianne Chris and talked of Marilyn's presenting issues, her conflict with her husband, her feeling unsupported by her acting coach. So that's all accurate. But then the rest of the session is kind of our artistic license to allow a vehicle for Marilyn to begin to talk about her childhood so that the audience can learn that information. And so we, in the session, we try to make it as authentic as possible based upon what we know happened. Marilyn was used to laying on the psychoanalytic couch and having the therapist behind her. And Greenson thought that she was too fragile for that form of treatment and wanted to do more supportive counseling. So he met with her face to face. Well, this made her uncomfortable. So we we have her we have her in the session with Greenson kind of triggering issues that Marilyn wants to avoid. And he well, confronts and, and, her on those issues. Yeah, yeah. And you know what's interesting in listening to it, because for those of us who have been through therapy, for the listening audience, some of you maybe have not, back in 1962, how they would do therapy versus today, right? But one of the things that I found very kind of enlightening uh, and may help the audience is that we do get triggered. That's why we go to therapy is so that we can trigger some of these issues in order for them to be healed. And what would you say to somebody that maybe be going through something like Marilyn, Gary, that is not quite ready to confront that issue? What would you tell them? Well, there's a few things, um, beginning with the fact that this wasn't uh, yet a safe therapeutic relationship for her. She had that connection and that rapport with Dr. Chris. So now she's working with someone completely new. He's a man. So as a male, I think he triggers issues for her. We know about Marilyn's um, issues with father figures. She was used to working with a female clinician with whom she felt safe. And uh, she just wasn't, wasn't ready. And so the question becomes, when I am ready, what will be the first step? How will I know I'm ready? And when I begin to address these issues in a safe therapeutic relationship, what will then become different in my life? What will, what will change at that point? So you're almost trying it on versus you're actually doing it, but you're trying it on. And I think that's an important one because you definitely see her getting triggered and he keeps pushing, I think gently, but he still is trying to, to push her through this so she can get to the other side. Randall, what are your thoughts in terms of this episode in regards to the Greenson therapy session? Well, the first thing that we wanted to address was where Marilyn was at in terms of her medication and what she was taking. So this is why Greenson says, well, we've got to get that under some kind of control. 
Gary, you can speak about what Marilyn was taking at that time. But also I wanted to say that the episode kind of happens as the first part is the introduction, which is the, the factual information that we have. And then the second part of the family's history is based on a number of actual documented, uh, there's a lot of documentation in how we constructed that uh, narrative that she talks about her family history, beginning with Tilford Hogan, her great-grandfather. That was a lot of research. And to get distill that down into, you know, several minutes of conversation without it being, you know, a little bit too dry for people, for me as a writer, was, a, was an interesting challenge and how to make it interesting and how to build beginning, a middle, and an end to it. And, of course, we have that one flashback scene, which I really wanted to show some part of the family in history and Marilyn give some background on, on Tilford. And I think as far as her knowledge of her family, that's where it began. So that's where we wanted to begin at that point in her life and what she, what she knew about. And then, and then Marilyn begins to allude to an incident involving her grandmother. And she yeah. doesn't quite feel safe yet talking about that with her new therapist. And so in a future episode, we'll, we'll learn what that situation was. And I think that for the audiences listening in, not only are you listening to Marilyn's history and legacy, but you're listening, potentially you're seeing how everything's connected. And a lot of times people just want to brush over the family legacy. And we all have family legacies, the good, the bad, and the not so pretty. And for us to really illustrate the kind of depth of, of Marilyn's issues, I think you have to go back and see how it's connected. And it doesn't mean that you have to be defined by those kind of traits that your family has, you know, from mental illness and stuff. But I do think that you can't just gloss over it and say that it doesn't exist. Unfortunately, back in 1962 and earlier, they didn't have the right kind of therapy and medication and all the things that really deal with those kind of disorders. But I think seeing how it's all connected and how her family history, if it's not dealt with from legacy, you know, from family generation to generation, it continues. And you see how it was continued in Marilyn's family legacy. And she was trying to break the cycle. And the treatments were more effective for her than in the generation of her great-grandfather and her grandmother and her mother. Um, and now it's significantly more improved. So um, prognosis is much more promising in the 21st century, which unfortunately <laughs> Marilyn's uh, family you know, didn't have access to that. And that's one of the reasons why we're doing this for everybody is because <laughs> right. we're trying to reduce the stigma between mental illness and addiction. Look at how much Marilyn achieved in her lifetime with the fragmentation that she had and how many of us um, now that might be walking around with mental illness and or addiction and that there is help and resources and it doesn't, you don't have to walk around with all this shame anymore. One of the things in the episode that I felt really strongly about was to start to lay the groundwork for the subsequent episodes that we're going to be talking about um, in Marilyn's life. Because when you start at the beginning of a story, it's always better because then the audience has context. And the issue of mental illness, I think, runs through just about everyone's family that I, that I know of. Yes. And, and so everyone can relate to it. And the idea that Marilyn was dedicated to really transcending some of this, although she was very aware of it and much of it was still traumatic for her to remember and think about, I think she was actively focused on getting better, uh, getting beyond it, being able to work, being able to have a family and have relationships. And so I think that realization and that the, we talk a lot about re her resilience yeah, uh, it's a really important part of this, but we want to have the audience understand what is she moving from and what that process, as I mentioned in an earlier Norma Jean Discovering Truths episode, for people to really understand the pattern of her life. Episode one and two was about a moment in time in her life. So this episode really begins what we're going to be talking about through episodes four, five, six, and seven, which deal a lot around her early childhood. Well, and I find it really interesting, too, because that patterning is a lot of times I, I'm sure we all have been either in a statement or a question. Marilyn was happy the day she died or Marilyn was really sad and what a tragic figure. And as you're seeing, people aren't that one dimensional. 
there is a lot of complexities to why people do what they do. And so that's one of the reasons also why we're starting at the very beginning. Um, so Gary, tell us a little bit more about the Greenson relationship. When did she start working with Greenson? Well, in 1960, she uh, met with him when she was in crisis on the film Let's Make Love. She didn't work with him again until she went into crisis again on the production of The Misfits, and she was hospitalized at Westside Hospital in Los Angeles. Then she uh, returned to New York and continued to work with Dr. Chris. But Marilyn's career was on the West Coast. So in the late um, summer of 1961, she began spending more time back in Los Angeles and needed a more permanent uh, pr provider. And so she had already had these sessions with Greenson and she decided that he would serve her while she was spending more of her time on the West Coast. And I find it really interesting, you know, because back in the day, it seems like all the celebrities were going to therapy. You had Cary Grant, you had Frank Sinatra. I assume Judy Garland, was Judy Garland also going to therapy? Was Greenson? Uh, well, it was a luxury, you yeah. know, it was a luxury psychoanalysis and it was also for um, someone who could afford it. So it involved <laughs> going to sessions multiple times a week for up to sometimes 90 minutes. Wow. And uh, that was I know it seemed like they were going like almost every day these actors. It was really interesting to, you know, today therapy doesn't, you know, unless HMOs, you like short term <laughs> therapy. Yeah. And and that and that's the difference. It it was considered something long term that you would be in analysis for like five to seven years. And, you know, now we have interventions, cognitive behavioral interventions and medication interventions where you can get some uh, immediate results or fairly immediate results. And Greenson was seeing her almost daily, wasn't it? In the last few months of her life, um, he was, but he had a, a very unique relationship with his famous patient. So he really crossed some of the boundaries and his treatment plan for Marilyn involved eventually inviting her into his personal life and into the life of his family, his wife and his adult children. She was a guest at their home. <laughs> She had sessions in his house. After the session, she would have dinner with the family. They had an etched champagne glass with her name inscribed. She would mm -hmm. keep her champagne in their refrigerator. She would be peeling potatoes in their kitchen. Some of that was wow. actually originally a part of this episode at one time in the writing process, uh, a scene in, in Greenson's home, but we decided to focus on the actual family history, and so all that got cut out. Yeah, I'm we've got plenty a... of time for that to, to yeah. bring that one around, because yeah. as you know, we're bouncing around in terms of her life. But a lot of people know about her later life, but they don't really know the beginnings. And I think for me, it's fascinating. And I, I know a lot about her. So to kind of seeing these episodes come to life, it's been an interesting experience. And that's what we're wanting the audience to have right. here. Hey, Gary, yeah. can you talk a little bit about in the early part of the episode, we, we talk about Marilyn's medications. Can, so can you kind of give us some background facts on that? So G Greenson was highly disturbed by Marilyn's use of drugs. You know, she had a horrible time with uh, insomnia, which was likely due to the, the bipolar illness. And she was doctor shopping, which was a common practice in the day. And so he felt that she was at risk of killing herself. And so he wanted to reduce her intake of barbiturate drugs. Now, back then, there weren't effective antidepressant meds or mood stabilizers. So doctors were prescribing um, sedatives, um, barbiturates, which were highly addictive and highly dangerous. And so he really wanted to reduce that. But, you know, you're looking at a woman who worked in the film industry and the film industry itself, they had studio physicians. And at 20th Century Fox, where Marilyn worked, Lee Siegel was the prescriber there. So it was pretty common practice in all of the studios that they would medicate their stars. They needed them to work. They needed them to work long hours. So they were often given amphetamine drugs so that they had energy during the day. Then they had to be prescribed sedative drugs so that they can sleep and get ready for yeah, work we the just next saw day. This, we just saw this in the Judy Garland movie, you know, in the very beginning, you know, in the in the morning, she was given one thing and the nighttime she was given something else, you know, exactly set up and, for and this kind of behavior. Yeah. She was a, a teen at the time. Yeah. Now, yeah. You know, we, we don't exactly know what Marilyn was being prescribed by the studio, but we do know that she, she saw Lee Siegel through the studio and in her private life. 
And so, you know, with Maryland's unique diagnoses, these medications could be extremely dangerous. You know, you're building up this tolerance to the medication, the overuse of the medication. And for someone with bipolar disorder, amphetamine drugs can trigger a manic episode. So this was, wow. you know, and it was also the 50s where, you know, these drugs had come out and we didn't know much about them and they were considered like the modern marvel. Your life can be improved with a simple pill. We just didn't know how dangerous they were. And we're but, also seeing a really strong link you know, Marilyn was self-medicating herself to disguise the mental illness and the major depression and everything else that exactly. she had, had going on. And I think for those of you that may be listening, either yourself or a loved one, I think this is really important to look at is that you got to make sure that you have the right treatment. So that way, if you are having some of these either addiction or mental illness, you can get to the root of it versus just masking it. And this, uh, this is what substance misuse really is all about. It's about someone in pain trying to self-medicate their symptoms of mental illness. These things go hand in hand. Wow. Well, I, you know, I know that also Marilyn was very protective over her family and Randall, you certainly can talk about that in regards to writing the episode. She was reluctant to reveal certain things, and we know from analyzing Marilyn's interviews and what she said over the course of times as she gradually became more and more famous, her story changed. Much of that, I think, was at first to protect her family from the press uh, so they wouldn't go looking into and, and bothering I know, members of her family who were alive at the time, especially her mother or her sister. Uh, her mother was especially vulnerable because yeah. her mother was at Rock Haven Sanitarium, severely mentally ill. And you could imagine Marilyn wanting to protect her mother from the press who would maybe seek her out, which yeah. they did after Marilyn's death when she was no longer able to protect. And her also, mother. also, Gary, yeah. speak to the fact that we actually do have a family member of Marilyn's that's still alive. And who is that family? Yes, member? her half sister, Bernice Miracle, who is alive and well at 100 years old in in North Carolina. And I actually have a, I got from auction a letter that Bernice wrote to Marilyn in 1960. And the beginning of the letter actually talks about Bernice giving Marilyn her new phone number because of, a, of an article that had been released and that information had gotten out. And so she had to protect her anonymity sure. through changing her phone number. It's really interesting that uh, all these years, for the most part, Bernice has, has uh, remained quite silent. And I think that shows, you know, that sometimes it's not about just the press and getting more fame. She, if anything, she's removed herself from that. Hey guys, we're finishing up this episode. Is there anything else that we want to wrap up with talking about episode three and the intensity of really laying the foundation of Marilyn's life? One thing I would say is that the subsequent episodes, as we look at her early childhood, I think there's going to be a lot of surprises in it for people because we have new facts and new information and new documentation and things from auction. And so if you think you know Marilyn's early life, I would really suggest that you go to our website. We've got some great photos on there that show you actually the things that we're talking about in the episodes, behindtheicon.com. And also enjoy the story. See how much you really do know. And test yourself. I think the fans will kind of have fun with that. And for the people that don't know her at all, it'll be a rude awakening because you, you probably <laughs> yes. have an image of who you think Marilyn is. And I think everybody that's listened to at least episode one, they were just like, wow, I had no idea. So just remember, this is the beginning. How about you, Gary? How do you, uh, how, is there anything else that we've left out of this episode that you want us to address before we well, close? Well, as you learn more about Marilyn, you'll find that she'll stay forever in your heart. Hmm, that's beautiful. So on that note, for everybody listening today, hold a good thought for Marilyn, but hold a good thought for yourself. Mm -hmm.